So let's start my time here. <laughs> so thanks again, um, the organizers to uh, for invite us to give a talk here, me and Hostio. It's really a pleasure and thank for patience because I'm a difficult person to answer reply uh, my mails. So I am uh, Sandra Avila, and as uh, Veronica said, I am professor at the Institute of Computing at the University of Campinas in Brazil. And also Bissoto is a PhD candidate and I am his advisor. I was his advisor also in master uh, thesis, and he's concluding. I'm happy to share that he's concluded his PhD in a few weeks, year or so. And today we'll talk about how uh, we propose to evaluate bias, uh, skin lesion data sets and models. And if uh, we change a little bit uh, the topic that was previously announced, because we are talking about the PhD uh, topic of our sale, and the last one is from another uh, PhD student. Okay, so. Um, so skin cancer, yeah, why do you care about that? And of course, everybody cares about cancer, but why uh, we should we, our team as Brazilian, um, care about that? And because skin cancer accounts for, in Brazil, 30% of all malignant tumors recorded. So it's a really uh, important uh, subject here. And uh, 10 years ago, we decided to employ machine learning techniques to research machine learning techniques to detect um, skin lesions and classify them accordingly. And our research lab, the Record AI, um, has been working on melanoma detection, and melanoma is the most dangerous type of skin cancer uh, since 2013. And since then, oops. Since then, we have been uh, very excited that our research has been reported to in newspapers, TV news, podcasts, social media, and of course, scientific and scientific papers and scientific conference. And it's me in those pictures, but my hair looks a little different today. So before we start in uh, discussing, we start discussing how, in fact, we avoid bias. I would like to give you the big picture of our research, and I promise that I will be quick. So we start in two thousand fourteen, and when we start in the pre uh, pre deep learning area, but soon, really soon, in the same year two thousand fourteen, we decide to move forward uh, with uh, deep learning. And uh, because transfer learning seems so central for applying deep learning and is still, in fact, central in melanoma classification and in many applications, we investigate transfer in detail. Also, we uh, participate in, seven, in 2017 uh, in the Isaac challenge. And a lot of people here said the Isaac is our important data set. Yeah, and it was a, a little uh, a game change for us. Uh, that that competition, that challenge, not about the competition, but because our finds after this competition. So our team participated in two tasks, lesion segmentation and classification task, and we are ranked third in the classification tasks. And about uh, that competition, our finds show, not surprisingly, but in a systematic review, that the amount of training um, data has a huge influence explaining almost half the variability in performance. So in 2017, uh, we know that data collection annotation is still is an expensive, time consuming and challenge to obtain. And the question that we did at uh, that time was, how do you create large shared data set? In fact, we are still posing that question until today. But our idea at that time was, okay, let's to solve or mitigate, to bypass this problem, in fact, was um, generating realistic synthetic skin lesion images. And that's the point, that's exactly the moment that Alceo started his uh, master thesis. And, and after that, 
uh, our skin lesions were so good, so realistic, and that's not a uh, 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 a good point. In fact, it was a bad point that we start to think about uh, bias. And we pose the question, are you really improve augmenting our data set or does it get even more bias? So, and the answer is it's get more bias, yeah? So if bias is present even in bigger and more diverse data set like ImageNet, yeah, it's naive to think that it's not presenting in smaller and hard to obtain skin cancer data set. So from this year until now, we decided to focus on, on how to understand, or how to evaluate, uh, how to deal uh, with the bias, its source, and the idea is to improve our data sets and, of course, and our models to apply it to, uh, in fact, to the calculation. So, and we decided to create, and that's the topic of, the, of this uh, presentation, this talk, we decided to create what we call trap sets, and we are talking about the trap sets. And we named this way because bias model by learning superior correlation fall into trap and have poor performance on tests. And also we explain this idea in a few minutes. So just so right here, we have been approached skin image, skin image analysis on many fronts. That's the last paper we approach the idea of generative AI, in fact, to generate synthetic uh, images. We are using our trap sets for domain generalization. We are also approaching self-supervised learning, uh, transferability metrics. We can talk this in another, uh, in fact, in another talk. Um, and uh, I'm putting since 2022, uh, my, all my efforts, uh, a big effort here on acquisition of um, skin leisure in dark skin people. And uh, we still, we are also researching on federated learning and the idea to research that to really apply, for example, those models on hospitals. We are also research on transferable metric generalization, and we still research on self-supervised learning. Okay, so that's the big picture before I'll still talk about the, um, about the trap sets. Also, I think you will change. Yeah, yeah, you're sure? yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can you can you stop Just, your? Yeah. Okay. It's better if you control, if you can control your slides. Yeah. Okay. So I'll talk specifically about evaluating bias in skin vision models, and like Sandra said, I'll talk about trap sets, which has been with us since the beginning of our research in 2020. And before that, I'll just give you just a little context on the evaluation of shortcut learning. I know most people in this webinar is interested in shortcut learning. It's not like a new concept for most people. But anyways, just to be complete, uh, shortcut learning, it's a problem of uh, mismatch between train and test sets, where on training, for example, there is some spurious feature. And in this case, is the background of the image. And... Uh, the thing is that on test, this correlation of the spurious feature to the actual target of the classification task changes. So before water is correlated to the water birds and on test, uh, now it's land. So of course, if the model learns to uh, classify the samples based on this spurious feature, it will heavily be penalized during test. And what we want to do is to have something similar, but now for medical imaging. Uh, the problem is that, well, for medical imaging, most problems get even more complicated than they originally are. And uh, first problem is that it's pretty rare for medical imaging to have artifacts, annotations, or any type of annotation that that can explain some, some biases. I know this has been changing. Amelia has a, a nice work on this front too. And uh, this is the, the, the solution that we've been pursuit since 2020. So basically the big picture here is that we, uh, since artifacts are easy to annotate and they don't require expert knowledge in terms of medicine for it, 
we annotated the Isaac data set with respect to these to seven artifacts. I'm just showing five in here. And uh, when we evaluated the correlations of these artifacts to the actual target of the, the classification targets, we saw that the correlations were mild and that when we divide our training and test sets just randomly, the correlations are also similar. So it's not the ideal way of measuring bias reliance for our models. Our solution for that was exactly trap sets. And uh, I will try to explain to you how trap sets work. Trap sets is, uh, is the separation, is a training test separation that is the result of an optimization problem. So the idea is that we want first to control the levels of bias, basically amplify these correlations, these spurious correlations on the training data. And at the same time, we have the opposite correlations between training tests. So in this very simplified scenario, this is what I will use. We will have only two variables for the bias. So basically presence or absence of one specific characteristic, for example, ruler and a binary classification task. The, the, the classification task is described by the color and the bias are the shapes of the objects. So ideally, when I divide this on training tests, I will create, for example, this red circle and blue square on training. And if the model learns to classify based on the shape, it will, it will heavily fail on test. That's the basic idea. The basic idea. The thing is that, like I said, is posed as an optimization problem, and it goes like this. Basically, we can divide our data, considering these two classes and these two biases, into four different subgroups. And the output that I'm expecting for trap sets is the how many samples for each subgroup that we'll allocate for training. The remaining ones will be our sent to test, but uh, I have variables here to quantify this, this uh, how, how many samples basically I will, select, I will select for training for each one of these sub subgroups. Then we want to amplify these biases. So the, ideally I want to put, for example, A and D on test, for example, and B and C on training. Why? I want to have both classes present in both training and test. And I want if the model learned to classify based on squares and it learned that the square is actually correlated to the red class, it will fail on test because now the, the blue is, is actually circles and not squares anymore. To transform this into a optimization problem, we have to define first some constraints. So first we have, of course, the maximum amount of samples we have for each subgroup. So A, B, C, and D are limited by the amount of samples on the data set. And there are also some machine learning aspects that we want to control. Mainly we define the size of the training and test sets. So we want, for example, training to be 70% of the data and test 30%. And to avoid, uh, for example, that the test set is particularly difficult because of the because it has much more malignant samples, we also control the class ratio. So the same class ratio that is on training is also on test. And then the challenge that we are introducing are indeed because of the biases and not because of the prevalences of the diseases. Then we solve uh, an objective function where we penalize basically a and B for being on the same set and the same C and D for being the same set. So here is uh, an example of, for example, a weight matrix that we could use. We have the same, we, uh, as a baseline, we use the equal importance to all subgroups. We, don't, we are not trying to prioritize putting one specific subgroup on training or on test. The only thing that we are trying to do is to create these opposite correlations. So A and B, they have opposite signals, the same for C and D. And then we have like a candidate objective function or the same thing it is not necessary for A uh, and, and D to be a test. They could also be trained. So we try all these different objectives, functions of val uh, valid opposite correlations. And we just choose the one that yields the highest score. This will hopefully give us a separation of training tests where they are actually different with respect to the artifacts they present and the correlations of the artifacts and the, the, the targets are different. Hopefully it will be even clearer here now, but the idea is that we have 
if we put this on a scale on the left mode, left leftmost part, we will have the random separation where despite there is bias, we are not, there are uncontrolled biases. And on the rightmost part of the scale, we will have the trap sets on one, which is the learned separation. To be able to consider in our research also mild biases, we created some interpolations of these two sets. That is, when we are dividing training, on training and, te and test, sometimes we follow the random separation, sometimes we follow the trap separation, and this allows us to create all these intermediate data sets where with controllable levels of biases. If we look at the correlations themselves of these variables and, and the classes, we can see that if we do the random separation, like I showed before, the correlations are similar between training and tests, and they are uh, mild. On trap sets, which is the factor one in here, the numbers are pretty high, are higher at least than before, and the correlations are now opposite. So if the correlation of dark corner and uh, benign and the target, cl uh, the, the classification target was positive during training, now it will be opposite, and the model will be punished by using this information during test. If we now use the sets to train our models, train and evaluate our models, we can see uh, uh, some behavior like this. On the left part, it is the unbiased scenario. So the performances that we can have is they're pretty high, above 95%, 90% AUC. But as we amp 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 amplify the biases uh, going to the right, we can see that we reach to below 60% AUC, which basically means that the model is just guessing the right result in a binary classification. So it shows that we, these data sets that we found, they are effective at at least evaluating the reliance on bias. And a, a better solution, a robust solution, would yield a more flat line in this graph. Just to give you some uh, example of uh, the biasing solution, this is our latest work on this front. It's called Test Time Selection, or TTS for short. And uh, we build on the idea that we, we, we had before that models are able to learn robust features even in presence of biased training sets. The thing is that if the test set also presents those biases, the models prefer those solutions instead of falling to the robust features that it also learned, it just chose not to use. So to encourage models to use these more robust features, what we do is we put a human in the loop in form of a, an annotator in here. And this annotator will provide us with positive and negative key points, which are basically locations of the image that it has positive or negative interest. And we will filter the extracted features of our model that was previously trained we will filter these features in order to how well they match with this uh, annotation provided by the, by the human. Uh, then we just, we rank all these features in terms of how well they match, and we just keep the ones that really match well with the positive and negative key points. To do that, we basically keep them, uh, we don't alter them, but we zero out all the others that uh, don't, that have low sim similarity. So in the end, we are not retraining anything. There's not uh, new parameters or parameters changing in our, in our model. What we are doing is just selecting features in here. We are just zeroing out the, the, the attention maps that do not match the expectations of our, our annotator. And by doing this simple procedure, we can have a very different behavior in with trap sets. We can see that in the rightmost part, we have an improvement of over almost 20 percentage points, which is very considerable. And, uh, and this shows also for the mild biases. More interesting, because we are based on this human in the loop, we can make use of different types of annotations. We, uh, we've had before annotated skin lesions with respect to the artifacts, the presence of these artifacts. And for this work, we also annotated them with respect to the location of these artifacts. So they can provide as a proxy, like, a, like, like, like it behaves in an annotator that says, that uh, identifies the location of these artifacts. So uh, we are using 
the negative locations as an input and the location of the lesion itself as a positive key point. And our results showed that even having a single pair of these annotations, a single pair of key points, one positive and one negative, we can reach over 10 percentage improvements, uh, 10, 10 percentage points improvement over our baseline. That is very low because of trap sets, 58 going to up to 68. And as we use better annotations, in this case, not just identifying lesion and background, as we have, for example, the location of these artifacts, the performance goes even higher. So just as to as a closing closing remarks, we intend to expand trap sets for multi-class problems, other contexts. So if you work on different contexts, you have annotations and you are intending to evaluate your solutions, feel free to contact us first, of course, we can work on this. And also evaluate, consider evaluating our models robustness using trap sets because this has been part of our research and has been served us really well. Uh, finally, our models, we verify the models are able to learn robust features even with biased data sets and we think an interesting direction for the biasing is indeed doing test time the biasing without necessarily changing the weights, but changing the decision making of the models, uh, limiting its uh, what solutions it can choose from. That's it. Thank you very much.